What's up, everybody? Welcome into another episode of the Celtics Talk podcast here on the NBC Sports Boston Podcast Network. And oh, it's playoff time. Yep, the regular season is over. The Boston Celtics surging all the way to the number two seed. I want to start there before we even get into our we have a we have a whole Brad Stevens themed episode coming up for you. But off top, just want to just want to touch on what a remarkable season this has been. Brad Stevens first at the helm as the executive of the Boston Celtics and um, just remarkable. Like I, I keep saying it, that the Celtics, it was 18 and 21 and then, you know, going 30 and uh, trying to do my quick math here, 20 uh, down the 30 and 11 down the stretch or 30 and 10 down the stretch. Uh, just an, an insane turnaround for uh, this team to finish 51 and 31 after the way it started again, that 18 and 21 start. So uh, remarkable that they got there. I know there is a little bit of consternation about the potential options as we wait for the playing game. Uh, but ultimately I think what the Celtics did is they told their guys like, look, we trust you in whatever comes next. And you've been the best team in basketball for the past three months and don't hide from that. There's no sense in gaming the system. Uh, I keep saying it like, the basketball gods are a petty bunch. And if you disrespect them in any way, uh, no amount of Kyrie Irving sage can tre- change uh, like the outcome if you disrespect the basketball god. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of weeks with, uh, with, with the first round of the playoffs and whoever the Celtics end up facing, whether it's the Brooklyn Nets or the Cleveland Cavaliers. But just a remarkable season for the Boston Celtics, one that I've never experienced as a as a writer in terms of of the turnaround really not a lot of teams in the league have come this close i think i saw a note last night at the celtics uh and the the most the, the most drastic turnaround in nba history over the final 41 games uh especially when you consider going from 11th in the eastern conference up to number two but as i told you the focus today is on brad stevens and uh put together a story for today that you can check out on NBCSportsBoston.com, and essentially, you know, just reflecting on Brad's first year. I think the the big thing that stands out to me is uh, Brad, when he took over this post, the big question was, okay, you know, we know Brad's is going to be successful in whatever he kind of puts his mind to, uh, but will he be bold enough in this position? Will he have the ability to put aside the relationships he had with these players as their coach and make the tough decisions that might shape this roster into a legitimate title contender. And you look at what Brad did from the first days on the job, making that Kemba Walker trade, you know, like how hard that have to be. Kemba was adored by his teammates, by Brad, but Brad also realized like whatever was going to happen next, it probably didn't involve Kemba. And the Celtics needed that flexibility kind of rolls the dice, taking back 35-year-old Al Horford. And Al finds a fountain of youth and emerges as a key piece of not only all of Boston's success, but especially their number one ranked defense. A couple days later, he hires Ime Adoka. I think there's a lot of teams out there in the league looking around now going, man, you know, we they they went for people with a little bit more name recognition, a little experience. And uh, Ime might, might have been the right guy. He was at least the right guy for this Celtics job. And Brad identified that what Ime does differently from him and that uh, warm, but demanding sense uh, has really helped these Celtics go to another level. I think we've seen it, especially the last probably 10 weeks where Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown have embraced facilitating and making teammates better uh, and sort of that next step in their own evolution as individual superstars by making the team better with their play. And so Brad then goes into the season. Well, not even, let's, let's not jump that far ahead. He, he signs extensions of Robert Williams and Marcus Smart. And I know a lot of people were at, at me. So when I, I wrote an article before it happened and said, like, I think this is going to happen. And the reason was like, there was, it, it made sense, but it was also not a slam dunk move. Uh, the Celtics did it. And now Robert Williams might have the best contract in basketball if he stays healthy. Marcus Smart has proven himself as the quarterback on both sides of the floor, might win defensive player of the year this year, should win defensive player of the year this year, uh, and has sparked the number one offense in the league over the last 35 games. Uh, It looks like steals now for Brad Stevens with what he accomplished even before the start of the season. And then you get into the year and the Celtics are struggling. I think the biggest thing Brad did was not panic, you know, didn't, didn't overreact. There was a lot of people on this podcast, not me. You can rewind the tape. I didn't say this, but that we're even considering whether Jason and Jalen needed to be split up in order for this team to thrive. I was worried. I didn't have the, I didn't have any answers for you either. 
I always knew the core could be good together, but I didn't know, you know, how you, how you put this thing together when it wasn't working uh, through January 6th, but he was rewarded and Brad stayed the course. And then at the trade deadline, he cleans up some of the, uh, not I don't want to call them mistakes, but they rolled the dice with guys like Dennis Schroeder and Ennis Freedom, but they didn't fit in terms of what this team wanted to do. So Brad goes out there and turns two players, you know, sends out five players and brings back two, but Derek White and Daniel Tice, especially now with Rob sidelined, has been vital to the success of this team. So I mean, just Brad hitting all the right buttons. Now, I'll say this, Brad paid some steep prices at times. Uh, had to give up a first round pick to make that Kemba deal at the start of the year. Gave up another first in the Derek White deal. And, and there's a pick swap in 2028 when, I mean, just think about it. Jason Tatum would be 30 when that trade, uh, when that pick swap comes on the table. So that's that's a long way out for a guy who's perpetually 19. So maybe they'll pay a price down the road. But what I love is, you know, for in almost a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a cultural shift, the focus was on now. And I think Danny Ainge was really great about trying to keep those draft picks and, and trying to find low cost ways to supplement a pricey core. But with Brad, there was just no fear. There was just this, I'm going to make moves because I think it's for the best of the program. And I'm not going to worry that, you know, if they don't work, it's going to fall back on me. And, you know, I had a chance to catch up with Brad before the season. And he was just like, uh, you know, for the first part of his career, he was very scared in, in terms of like coming into coaching at Butler that, you know, he would make the wrong move or, or, or the, just the, the, the general idea of failure. And now he just doesn't even think about it. He's like, I'm just going to be myself and make the moves and see what happens. So that brings us to our, to our guest this week, Todd Licklider, who was the former coach at Butler University, uh, was an assistant along with Brad on the way up that chain, was then a Celtic scout for a few years while Brad was on the Boston bench. Now is the head coach out at Evansville uh, and trying to get back into the coaching game and, and rebuild another program out there. But uh, he's been along the uh, along the journey with Brad uh, for pretty much his entire uh, coaching ride here through Butler into Boston and all that. And so I thought he'd bring some good insight from what set Brad apart back then to the, you know, Brad taking over Butler and doing what he did there. And then the successes of his time in Boston, but especially that transition up to, up to general manager. I just think it's, it's fascinating. You'll hear Todd say, um, you know, there was never a doubt. And I keep hearing this from people close to Brad. There was just never a doubt that he was going to succeed because whatever he puts his mind to, he's uh, he seems to to find a way to, to make it thrive. And now I, like I said, buckle up. We'll see uh, just how much this roster is able to, to be successful and where these playoffs take the Celtics, but future is bright. And uh, so I'm Brad to make sure he finds the pieces that keep this thing moving forward, even after this, this season is completed. So let's get into our interview with Todd now on the Celtics Talk podcast. All right, Todd, before I hit, I go way back and hit the rewind button, I want to go sort of just a, a scrub back a little bit. A, a year ago, 300 days ago, Brad Stevens gets named the new general manager of the Boston Celtics. I was stunned. I think a lot of people that just thought he would always coach were stunned. As someone who's been so close to him, what was your initial reaction when you heard Brad was taking that, that post? Uh, it made a lot of sense. I thought it was a really good move by, by Boston. And, uh, you know, he'd been in – uh, the league for a number of years. And if Brad's around uh, in any environment, in any situation for very long, he's going to have it figured out, to be honest with you. So made a lot of sense to me, um, you know, and, and who knows about the coaching? I, I, I'm, I'm not um, sure uh, that there's a, a timeline in coaching. I think you know when it feels right to make that next move and to contribute in another way. But uh, and and the other thing I noticed, um, uh, and I thought Brad had been involved uh, in personnel some as the coach. Uh, not that I understand all that in any way or understand the structure of the NBA, but I always thought there was a really good relationship um, or relationships in the organization. And so Brad was, you know, exposed to. Um, the, the jobs of the general manager, I think, and, and as maybe all coaches are, but I, I just thought it was a, a really good situation and unique, maybe unique and uh, helpful. 
It's funny because I think everybody I've talked to has said the same thing. He did, they just knew whatever whatever Brad was going to put his mind to, he was probably going to be successful at it. Like how early in the process of knowing Brad did you know that that just whatever you would task him with is something that he would he would flourish? Well, I'm not near as intelligent as Brad, so it probably took me a little longer to recognize. Uh, probably took him for granted, to be honest with you. Um, which, um, you know, I hope he forgives me now. Uh, but the one thing that I noticed about Brad was, or not one thing, but many things, is how talented he is and, and intelligent, but he's always a team player. And so there was never a job too small that he would not accept or not do really well. And so I knew uh, his future was bright in whatever he did because he, he maintained the right perspective. Take me back. One of the things that, 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 uh, that I guess is surprising to me. Is I guess the, the big question when Brad took over as general manager was, could he be bold enough? Would he make these, you know, hard decisions? And it's hard, right? When you've coached guys and now you have to go to making decisions, I think right out of the gates, having to make that Kemba moves, a player that is universally loved, but then having to do that. What is it about Brad that allowed him to just be able to, to put that emphasis on like the right move for the program over maybe just the, the relationship that he had with, with the players? That's an interesting question. I think that, uh, first of all, that uh, he has a, uh, a really good mind for, for um, ability and how players fit together and building a team. He's got a, you know, great insights in that regard. And then he's very professional as far as his approach. Um, he's going to analyze. He's, gonna, he's analytical. So he's going to analyze and figure out um, if it makes sense, if a move makes sense. And I guess the, the most important thing is, is he can do it um, relatively quickly. I think I do an okay job with some of those things, but it just takes so long it's too late. By the time I figure it out, it's like it's already happened. Uh, Brad's got the ability to, to analyze and, and make the, the correct decision, uh, what do they say, in real time. I mean, when he's, he's right involved in the situation. You were around this 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 franchise for for a few years. Were you surprised at all that they, they not so much that they were? It, it took a little while to get this thing going, but maybe more so the second half surge this team has made. You know, I, 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 I to me it's still astounding. It feels like two distinct seasons between you know the eighteen and twenty one start and the twenty eight and seven finish. What do you think allowed this team to to sort of flourish? Gosh, I, I couldn't evaluate that from, from afar like this, but you have to sure appreciate it and, and respect. And I should give everybody um, insight into um, staying the course, uh, probably making adjustments and all, but mm -hmm. um, never, uh, you know, never relenting. You always stay in the course and you don't know what the next – uh, steps going to be in the next opportunity and just seizing those opportunities. Uh, and it's good to see um, them be rewarded for, for the way they approached it and for their efforts. All right. Now I'm going to really hop in the time machine. I want you to take me back. What's the first time you remember uh, Brad Stevens appearing on your radar and, and what were those, what were those early interactions like? I got to tell you, I've had such fine memories. Um, I was uh, on staff for Thad Mata. And, uh, and he and I have been close for a long time and we were excited. It was Thad's first job. And, uh, Brad reached out, I think. And Thad said, yeah, sure. But that's very wise also. So he knew, <laughs> he knew Brad's potential and we were getting him for nothing. He was just going to come and, uh, leave a, uh, you know, a successful, potentially successful career at Eli Lilly and, uh, come and join us. And, so I asked him, I said, uh, how did you tell your parents this? Not that he was still at home or anything, but, you know, you yeah. kind of want to get the OK. But uh, so he, he showed up and then we took a um, international trip, went over to Finland and he joined us with it. And uh, he helped manage so much during the trip. It was just, you know, you could see the benefit of having him around and then uh, ended up moving into the uh, director of operations position so he and I spent a lot of time together. Um, he would just be in my office when he didn't have a particular task to do. I think he just knew that I had been in coaching for quite a while. 
So I might have a, a perspective or an answer that he, he would he would appreciate. And then when I do uh, individual workouts, a lot of times he'd come out with me, wasn't allowed to be on the court, wasn't allowed, but he would just sit and watch, which I think was really beneficial because um, it was just made a smooth transition. The next year I was hired as the head coach and I elevated Brad quickly to, uh, to assistant. And so he had, we had had so uh, so many experiences together during that time when we, you know, were serving on Thad Mata's staff. And uh, I think that was really helpful. Uh, and I just grew to have incredible trust for it, trust in him. What was it that distinguished himself? Just beyond the, now, now, you said he was a smart man, but leaving Eli Lilly, I, I, I remember <laughs> he telling me the story about like waiting tables at Applebee's and, uh, you know, not sure if he was going to get a job. I, I think it was, it's okay to question whether Brad was making the right decision there, but he had that trust in himself, right? That this was something he could thrive at. And, uh, you know, that's going to be unique on its own, right? Just someone who just believes in themselves enough to, to kind of throw caution to the wind. Yeah. And I think he was at a point, you know, um, that he could, he could take that uh, risk, but it was a calculated risk. I mean, he knew what he wanted to do. He knew where his passion was. And that's, there's a lot to be said for that. And, and that's if you've got the talent to do it also. And he did, he, you know, he, and uh, he helped us run it um, uh, more as a business, more in an organizational manner, but uh, also he, he had a great grasp for, for the game itself. And uh, he would come to me with, uh, ideas, suggestions, um, offensively, really, really good. But I think we also shared, you know, similar values and how we wanted to conduct our, our business and our team and our culture. Uh, that's the new, that's the big word in it, culture. Uh, it's yeah. kind of like just the atmosphere, the climate, whatever. Um, so in, I felt like not only did he buy into what we were doing, but he enhanced it. It's, it's funny you say that because it feels like that's what's happening with the Celtics right now. There's a distinct sort of culture that he was looking to build with Ime and the sort of team that he wants to operate. I think his moves, his initial moves, getting Al back and going and getting Derek White. It feels like the pieces fit. You, meant, you mentioned how good of he is at just trying to build the right structure. It feels like you know that, that's something that has persisted from his earliest days. What are your favorite memories from from Brad from from Butler? What what jumps out about whether it was on the court or off the court? Well, I I'd say my favorite memory is just that um, when we showed up in the office, um, it was always uh, a positive uh, experience. We were just working hard to to make this uh, program the um, to, to fulfill our vision for it. We had this really lofty f- vision and. Uh, we had to, we believed it, but we kind of had to sell it. And you had to sell it um, kind of systematically and consistently. And, and that's what I think, Brad, he's so consistent. So every day you knew he was going to be in there. You knew you were getting his best shot. He was going to have ideas for you. He was going to be recruiting. Um, there was no way that the program wasn't going to keep moving forward. And he wasn't alone. He'll tell you he had um, assistant coaches along with him in Laval, Jordan, and Matthew Graves and later Joel Cornett, Terry Johnson, all those guys have, you know, had uh, impact in other programs as well. Uh, but Brad really was our leader in that. And uh, so, you know, I, I think more than anything, it was just uh, how much we enjoyed um, building together and the environment. And we believed in, I don't think either one of us, when we were doing it, were really thinking about what our next move was or where we were going to go or what it was every, we were all in on this particular project. And uh, I don't know if you get to do that very often, but we are on the same page. We are aligned with the university. And uh, so I really appreciate um, not only that he believed in us, but that he showed how, how to make it happen. What's one thing people don't know about Brad? What don't we see? Like, because he seems very consistent, but we feel like there's got to be something where, 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 where that uh, that the people closest to him see that we don't. Oh, that's an interesting question. I I don't know to 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 be honest with you. I can't uh, I can't say. I I guess the, the thing that I would say is that he has a terrific perspective. Um, you know, um, and I think we were okay at this. We knew when. Um, when to, to, to be on task and, and when not to. And so I think there's probably some downtime and, uh, for him that he's not working, hopefully he's, you know, and he's able to, 
to manage that. He's got such a beautiful family. Tracy's such a, a great wife and his children are, are wonderful. And then uh, I've enjoyed getting to know his parents as well. So, um, you know, it's, uh, gosh, he, it's, it's a deal where um, you're so, uh, you appreciate so much that somebody of his caliber and his uh, has had, has enjoyed the success that he deserves. Well, and I think that's a big reason he even considered the GM position was it's a, diff- a little bit of a different lifestyle. You're not obsessed with the game every night. You get to actually <laughs> maybe watch your son's AAU basketball games and enjoy. Um, but I, I, I do think he's should- obsessed. He's yes. probably still obsessed. Yeah. <laughs> he, he swears he doesn't go home and, and, and obsess. And, but he does say that the, the losses still hurt yeah. more than the wins. And, and I mean, anybody who's been around this thing knows you linger over over what could have been far more than than what you accomplish. Uh, I, I need to, I need to tell you this because your name came up like I would say probably once a week, once a month in press conferences. So you should know what what an influence you had on him as well. I mean, there was probably reporters there that were like, who is this guy he's always <laughs> referencing? So uh, you should you should take great pride in, uh, in, in the way you've, you've groomed him. I do got to ask you this. OK, because like one of the things I people invariably bombard me with is they're like, well, you know, once you're a coach, you're always a coach. I don't know how it worked for you. Did you just get the itch again? Was it just the situation? You know, do you think Brad, and who knows, he might be the GM of this team for the next 30 years, and maybe it's a moot point, but do you think he'll ever get the itch again to be a coach? I will tell you this. He will uh, attack the job as if he's going to be there for the next 30 years. That's the one thing you know. You're not getting uh, partial work out of him. He's He's all in. And then if something happens, I suppose, you know, he'll, he'll evaluate it. But for me, um, I so much appreciated the opportunity. I got to scout a little for a few years yeah. for the Celtics and I really appreciate it. What a great experience. Uh, I miss being a part of a team. He's still a part of that team. When you're, when you're scouting, you're off, you know, you're off site. And, mm-hmm. um, and although you, you follow and you feel like maybe you've got a little bit of, um, uh, of in, input or whatever, um, you didn't feel like you were directly connected with a team per se, uh, where you were in the locker room and practice and all that. Um, so he still got that connection. So I, I would say, you know, um, I, w- I would not predict one way or the other. I just know that um, everybody will get his, they'll get his best for as long as he's there. That's great. Well, uh, I, like I said, you should you should take great pride. You, uh, you you just you can take credit for you were part of building this thing and with the oh, Celtics. Man. Like everybody, every every corner of the organization is involved in getting this team to where it was. And uh, but especially with Brad Todd, thank you so much for your time. It was my pleasure. Thank you, Chris. People from Indiana are like the nicest people ever. I'm just, I'm just convinced. Like Brad is super nice. Every person has ever, ever come out of Indiana, kind of like Canadians, just don't have a, it's just so sweet. And, uh, but like, you can tell, like he has such a respect for Brad and getting to see that entry point. I mean, Brad leaves this job, this probably well-paying job at Eli Lilly and is essentially waiting tables at Applebee's with no guarantee he's going to end up on the Butler coaching staff. And he finds a spot and kind of luckily, if you, you can Google it, there was some, uh, took a little, uh, took, took someone else's misfortune to get Brad's spot. Uh, but Brad certainly took advantage of that opportunity and he's taken advantage of the opportunity here with the Celtics when they made the, the, the change at the top of their uh, executive structure. And uh, I can't wait to see what comes next for Brad Stevens in his role as general manager or president of basketball operations of the Boston Celtics. Okay. I need you to, I know we end every episode by telling you need to hit the like and subscribe button and all that. But like this week, I really need you to, to kind of do it because we're taking this little week of, of quietness with the Celtics. And we're going to just load you up here on the Celtics talk podcast. We're putting the spotlight on someone. I think it's going to be just about every day. You know, we might, might have some, some very special guests along the way. I mean, I would, I would definitely make sure you're hanging out on, on Thursday, Friday area when we maybe get to some of the superstar players on this team uh, because there's some, there's some interesting thoughts coming about that group. So go find us there on your favorite podcasting app. Check us out on the YouTube page. And we'll see you all week on the Celtics Talk Podcast. <laughs>